We're going to look at 2 Corinthians today, verse 12. And look at this, very serious, a serious message God gave me today. And it says here, Unless I should be exhausted of all measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffer me, lest I should be exhausted above measure. For this one thing I besought, listen, for this one thing I besought the Lord thrice, that he might depart from me. Verse 9, and he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm going to talk about put it in his hands when you have no other choice. Take your seats. If you're watching me today, this message might be the very message for your deliverance. This message today just might be an answer to the problems in life. Putting things in God's hands when you have no other choice. Why did God give me this message? I do not know. But after I woke up about five this morning and got out of the bed and heard him talking, he, it's like words fell from heaven, and I tried to write down as it was coming. And I said, what text am I going to use? Didn't know. And the Lord said, I will give you the text. Then I started thinking about Paul's thorn in his flesh. And Paul, I preached about it once by standing with a thorn. But today I want to get in some deep stuff about stuff we have to trust God with when you have no other choice but to put it in God's hand. I think I was impressed by this message since I've been doing this series on putting it in God's hand. I was at a gas station two days ago getting some gas, and as I was filling up the gas, uh, some people drove up next to me to get some gas, and the, and the lady hollered, oh my God, that's Reverend Fleming. And quite naturally, I said, oh God, I'm discovered again, you know. I didn't really want to be bothered, but especially with somebody I don't know, and they're stranger, and then the husband got up, that is Reverend Fleming, and told his wife, and she, Oh, Lord, I didn't have my mask on when I was getting my gas. I wasn't expecting nobody. And they got out of the car, and she came up. And I didn't want to say, well, let me find my mask. I, was, I just had to say, well, let me just hear, hear what she said. Oh, Reverend Fleming, oh, you just don't know what I'm going through. I'm so glad that I see you as a man of God. We didn't know we would come drive up. I've been listening to you every Sunday talking about leaving in the hands of God. I was shocked. I said, wow. She said, oh, my God, what I'm facing. You just give me the word. I'm just going to put it in God's hand. And I just looked. She said, just pray for me. I said, I will. And her husband walked on off to go in the store. And she was just weeping. And I could see her heart. You're probably looking at me now. You don't know how you touched me when you were crying out. I'm just so grateful to see you. When you mentioned I've been looking at you, preaching these sermons in summer here, just put it in the hands of God. And that made me think about who we're touching. Because there's a lot of people going through things that are so horrific. You would not believe what some people face every day. And they don't know how to handle it. And so I just came up with the Summer Hill series. Just put it in God's hand. And the last time I preached to you, put it in God's hand and use what's in your hand. Use what you have and let God use that. So you touch me when you said that. I get touched by any comment somebody might type on there and say, Pastor, will you address this sermon? Will you preach this sermon? And I'd be sometime looking, and that leads me on to try to be a blessing to you. And what can I say that can really help you? Because my sermons here at Summerhill are more topical messages and 
uh, don't have the time to give a sermon like I want to because I want to be obedient and not hold you long. But I can best give you a sermonette and try to rush on and get through. But the point is that I want to tell you how important it is that we learn that when some things are out of your control, just leave it to God. There got to be a reason, Edgar, why some stuff God won't let you have control of. And it becomes a thorn in your flesh. Paul said he went up to heaven and he saw heaven. And when he saw heaven, he came back so much to himself. And he said when he got more exhausted and wanted to talk about it, God slapped him with a thorn. And then he asked God three times to move it. And God would not move it. And so God said, I'm not going to move it. But my grace is sufficient. In the other words, God said, I did it to you. Look at somebody and say, sometimes God will do it to you. <laughs> what? God, did you do this to me? Yes, I did. Why? I'm going to put you in a situation that you in something and you don't have nothing to do with it. You don't even have a choice in the matter. If you could choose, you would choose something else. You don't know why you married that knucklehead. You don't know why you married that contrary woman. <laughs> you don't know what, wait a minute, God, I could, what you say, I could be a better Christian if you just move this. <laughs> oh, I'm going to teach today. I could, Lord, I could be a better preacher if you just gave me all the good members that was really tired and take that load off them. Oh, preacher, wouldn't you be shouting? <laughs> wouldn't you say, oh, my, all my members are tired. I don't have to worry about the bills. But God says, no, I'm going to give you something to look you in the face every Sunday and give nothing. <laughs> Wait, God, I'd like to put them on out of here. And God said, no, if you're going to put them out, all of them need to go out. Amen. Who's worthy? One time a person came to me want to put somebody out of church. I said, Rev, I, want you, I think you need to put this person out of church because they ain't living right. I said, let's fine. Let's start with you. Amen. Let's start with you. Who's worthy to tell folk they need to put them out of the church? You got faults? Amen. Everybody got faults. And none of us deserve talking about one another. None of us deserve putting down another person because of that problem. None of us are in a position to, to throw nobody out. Amen. God's the only one who can throw you out. Amen. Because we all fall short. Oh. And some of us are a little shorter than the others. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. I don't have no choice. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for this word? Why in the world would God want you to put stuff in his hand when you have no other choice because only God is God? Only God is God. God will not share his glory with nobody. God's not going to let you be omniscient. That is all-knowing. You can't know everything. Only God know how the things will end. And I know you're going through all of it, but in the end, somebody said the end justifies the mean. I remember those days in college. But the end is going to explain everything. When we all get to heaven, we're going to know why God didn't do some things. When we get to heaven, we'll understand. The old folks say, We'll understand it better by and by. When we get to heaven, God will bring us the revelation why he did this to you. But only God controls things, and he's not going to let you have that 
uh, power or enough to know how the end going to close. That's why you got to put it in God's hand because God see the end. You don't see the middle. And you probably see the beginning. But you don't see the end. You don't know how none of this is going to end when God gets through working on you. But God see the end. And I don't know nobody in this world can see the end. So God is letting you know I'm God, not you. So therefore, you need to put everything you're running up against in the hands of God. Now there's another good point that the Lord wants us to know today. God gives us a cross to bear. All of us have to put things in God's hands. When I saw this lady almost weeping, and this was not a young woman. This was an older lady, and she was just, just in tears. I felt, felt like I saw her pain where she was facing and didn't want to tell me because it was just, you could see it. And sometimes people bear so much, they wonder how they're making it. But that's why I'm back to the point. God said, my grace is sufficient. What do you mean by my grace is sufficient? God said, I'm not going to move it, but I'm going to keep you while you're in it. I'm going to preserve you while you're in it. I'm going to sustain you while you're in it. No, I'm not moving it, but I'm... <laughs> Uh, but can you see why all this you going through, you still standing? I look at my own life and I said, God, I look back at it, 71 years old, going on 72, and I said, I don't get it. And sometimes I said, Lord, I don't get it. I don't know how you did this, what I went through. How did I get this for? How are you keeping me this strong? How are you keeping me still looking good? Cut all my hair off yesterday. <laughs> but you know what? I just say I'm tired of messing with it. <laughs> but here's the point. And when I got out of the Bible, the Bible said, hey, brother, you look like you're younger. I said, oh, now nah, I'm sure enough going to keep it on. <laughs> he said, you how old? I said, 71. He said, I don't believe. But you know what? God sustained me. If God, listen, if God is sustained, Staining you, and I'm not on a drop of medication, not a bit, and been a diabetic 25 years. And how God keeps me to not even at this age be on medication is why God has a purpose why he lets you go through so much. Because he's showing your enemies he's with you. Out of all I've been through over here and anywhere else, can't you see that nothing's stopping nothing? Out of all the stuff you go through with the few we got over here, is it stopping anything? <clears throat> Some of them need to leave. So we have peace. Who want to be around a whole lot of hell raisers that don't have us to heart? God sometimes will just allow things to happen to show you I'm doing this, not them. I take the little nickels and dimes and work miracles. I take the people that have kept this church and gave me the money to totally remind. And how that came in my hand was a miracle from God. He gave me 30 years to pay it with a... 3% interest. Thank you, God. <laughs> Don't you tell me, God, not with us. I want to survive. I'm running the church by myself every day. Amen. I let my son go on running his business. I say, I got this. You should have seen me yesterday around sweeping when I went back to church behind a big funeral. I go behind everything over there. And I did come over here looking. <laughs> I just didn't come in. But I looked at the door had fallen apart over to the house. And I said, I want to call somebody, go over here and fix this door. I'm telling my wife. She said, you just trying to see about everything. I said, that's me. If I come in here and I walk around and see something on the floor, I'm going to get it up. And if I ask you to get it up, you don't do it, I'll pick it up myself. 
And out of all that I do and working with the community, the community begging me, come in, we want you, I'll lead on camera. I said, I can't take the whole job, but I'm going to do the best I can. With all that I do on the community camera road and trying to run that church, and my secretary, Bob, has been sick for two weeks, and I'm still running everything, it ain't nothing but God. Thank you, Bob. I know you're looking, but I love you. You've been with me 25 years. But you know what? I have to take it on. Sometimes I'm the last one leaving that church because I make sure. And when I told you I get some air, I did. So if you over there cooling out, chilling, <laughs> it's because you know, members say, well, the pastor going to get it done. And the members will tell you, oh, he'll find a way. We went through five lawsuits by myself and held both these churches together and find a way out. Because I'm going to find a way. God will provide. His grace is sufficient. And I said when I'm finished and can't do no more, that's when I want to go on. Hallelujah. I, I had put in and retired at 71 and a half. And I thought by then I'd be a little weak that I don't want to carry on no more. But now I'll be 71 and a half in next month, and I'm still going. I ain't finna do nothing now. I'm going to be looking like Mother Thomas. When I get her age, 80-something years old, looking like that, and they haul, too. <laughs> you know what? When you stick with the things of God, Mama Tom will come here and sit by herself. I've been seeing all the, one or two other the mothers coming over here. And you know what? She said, I don't need nobody with me. I'm just blessed. And God, and I think she's driving or getting over here. Somebody bring her. Man, mother, I see Mother Carter out, but looking at her, I didn't know Mother Carter was no 90 some years old and was driving. Now, our son had to bring her, but she was driving me. I said, wow, I didn't know she's the oldest member in the church, and I didn't know the oldest member of this church is uh, uh, Twicky's mother. She's 90, she's almost 100. She is the oldest member, 98 or 99 in the home, but that's the oldest member in the church that still got her mind talking. She is the oldest member. How God preserving these people? My grace is sufficient. So you go to bear cross and you can't do nothing about it. You know what the next thing I want to tell you? God wants you to put things in his hand because everybody has problems. If I can get away with this, and I know my theology is sometimes pretty good, but I know some of you theologians are going to raise an eyebrow. Even God has problems. <laughs> I know Reverend Joel looking at me and hadn't said a word. God? You know who God's biggest problem is? Man. And you know what? Man's such a big problem. God, he said he repented, he made it. <laughs> Did you know God repented? He said, I'm sorry I made it. Have you ever said that about some of your children? <laughs> Lord, I'm sorry I brought him in this world. God was saying, I'm sorry I made him. Man has been God's biggest problem since God made him. I would go further enough to say if I can get away with it, God got a cross before he put the cross on his son. Now that's deep. God was burdened down with our sins. So when Jesus came to bear the cross, no wonder he was falling, rising and falling. But God was the first one who had the cross before he put it on his son. But the cross is something that you got to bear. And God has said, I didn't want this out of him, but he's so rebellious and hard-headed. I want to kill him, but I can't kill him. And that's a problem. Now, if God got problems, why you can't have any? Oh, Lord, I got you watching now. If God got to worry about some of us, he could just think us away. You know how God had to put up with us? And then he just 
takes it anyway because of his mercy. Who woke you up this morning and you didn't deserve it? You didn't even pray. And God said, you didn't even thank me for blessing you. And you got up and brushed your teeth and washed your face and ate your breakfast and walked on out of there and said, God ought to be glad to have me. <laughs> God, you ought to be glad I'm in church. Look, I'm there at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> God, woo! if our children could see what we go through, trying to keep a roof over you all's head. If you just knew what your parents were facing that they don't tell you about, you would love your mom and daddy. If you only knew that they were just hanging on sometime, trying to stay together, not because they didn't ha they had to, they stayed because of you. They didn't want you to come up being raised by another man. They didn't want you to come up being raised by another woman. They didn't want you to come up not having that love and compassion. And your mom, I, I learned to love my mom and daddy now because they put up with stuff just to take care of all eight of us. When your mother could have walked on out and left and she stayed there and took things. And your daddy could have gone on off with another woman and stayed there and took stuff and didn't go nowhere. I want you to wake up and start being grateful for your parents that didn't abandon you. And what about their future? They gave up their future for your future. Are you listening, children, when you want to obey? Are you listening? When you're stubborn and rebellious. Now I'll go talk to these children that are raised by other parents, not their own. That's been adopted. Oh! All of us going to have some problems. And you can't have no, no choice in the matter. I need to write a book on this. You don't have no choice in the matter. Now let me tell you something else. Why God... Won't move some stuff. Why is it that he wants you to put it in his hand when you have no other choice? You ready for this one? God know how we are. The Lord know how we are when we get blessed. <laughs> the Lord know just what changed people when he blessed them. And he won't give you that job. He won't give you that promotion. He won't make you rich. Because he'll lose you. I'm glad God gave me Mount Carmel when I first came here. They taught me how to pastor. I'm glad I didn't take Wheat Street Baptist Church. It was offered. Dr. Borders offered it to me. Called me five in the morning. And said, this is the greatest opportunity of your life. I want you to come. I don't want all this to go to waste. I was about 20 some years old, 28 maybe. I said, me, the history, we street and Ebenezer know not the world. And uh, I never felt qualified. I didn't never see in me what he saw. I, just, I, said, I can't go down there and preach to all those dignitary lawyers and doctors and millionaires. And why me? He said, I see in you what you don't see. And uh, I was scared. Then they came, pulled me out of mercy, and took me to Mo House, and I saw why he took me. Mo we Street wasn't going to call you if it wasn't a Mo House. Then they carried me through the Masonic and everything else. I even preached the Masonic Convention. Who put me in there? Borders were behind that. And I said, wow, looking at it now. He came to my house and begged me, take my church. And I turned it down. And I asked Ralph D. Abernathy, I said, Ralph, did I make a mistake? He said, yeah. Ralph D. Abernathy was a man with Martin Luther King. I said, why? He said, Mark Carmel is a great church. We knew Woods. 
We all knew Woods. He was a great preacher. But We Street and Ebenezer are known throughout the world, son. And you would have been worried now. He said, you made a mistake. I said, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I told Pop, I said, Reverend Barters, and I said it on national TV when I preached the 48th anniversary on TV. I say, I'm a mean young man. Pop's a mean old man. I get out of here and get thinking about it and left my church and make me mad. We'll be throwing chairs at each other all over this pulpit. <laughs> because I don't take no mess. <laughs> I'm a leader. And one deacon, Mr. Brunner, told me, that's why he wanted you. I said, really? You don't take no mess. We need a leader who can stand up with all the, the richest church in America at the time. Well, I said, God said, I'm going to build my own. And he came to Mount Carmel when we marched in and got up there and said it. I offered this to Fleming and he wouldn't take it. I said, no, um, I, I'm my own man. I'm going to build my own church. He saw me and they're just doing a documentary. You think I'm lying. They were putting out a documentary on me that's three hours long, and William Home Barter is speaking in the pulpit saying that he has, history had seen a preacher like me in 400 years. I said, wow, gifted in every kind of way and superb and all. I can sing gospel, I can sing opera, I can sing old camp meeting, I can preach anything, I can lecture, I can pray. Amen. He saw all these multiplicity of gifts, and I didn't see it then. Let me tell you something. Sometimes a blessing can be too much that God can lose you. I heard my professor saying when I finished Moe House, I was going on and matriculated, and I said, I want to go on and get a PhD. And I heard them arguing behind, and they didn't know what to do. But the boy, too much education will kill the boy's gift. And I heard them talking. I said, why are they saying that? They were arguing. He got enough. Don't kill his gift. I understand it. If I had gotten a PhD and on all that, you wouldn't hear me with no overall on talking about can't hardly get along. Holy can't hard. <laughs> I would be saying, that's too low class church. You wouldn't hear me hooping and preaching like I preach. And I preached around the world and know how to preach all kind of ways. But let me tell you something. It would have destroyed the naturalness. And I see what they're talking about. Look, God sometimes won't give you what you want because he will lose you. If some of you all hit that lottery and won 50 million, I wouldn't see you. I don't even see you when you get a million. I don't even see you now that you get a few hundred dollars. <laughs> Talking about uh, Reverend pray that I hit the lottery and I'm going to pay my tithe. You wouldn't give us none of that as a tithe. You'd be hollering, that's too much. What happened to us when we get blessed? Then think about it. We change. That's why God said, I'm going to keep you in this situation because you don't have no choice. I know you. I will lose you blessing you. You will never come to church if I made you a millionaire. You will never get on your knees and pray. Then you go to talking about the preachers if you keep getting so blessed. You go to putting the preacher down. But God put you in a situation you need us. I heard one great man say, why do I have to go hear a preacher when I can listen to the word myself and read it? I don't need a man to tell me how to live. I think that was Bill Cosby. See, what happened when people get wealthy, look how they change. And some of you movie stars, some of you basketball players used to be down in the ghetto, and some of you rap artists born in the ghetto. That's where you got all this rap from, sitting in the ghetto and 
created something that has become a million billion dollar industry and you won't come back and help none of those children that's in the ghetto where you were and won't give nothing to them and got 50 cars and can't drive a one at a time and you all can't come together and give a scholarship to all the black young men in the neighborhood money has changed you and you don't care. So I, I got mine. They need to get theirs. And some of you have been ignorant. And now you teach in school. And telling some child. You got to get yours like I got mine. Yeah. Nobody give me nothing. I'm not giving you nothing. Somebody did give you something. Somebody did give you an opportunity. But we change when God bless us. When God promotes us, he loses us all the time. And God said, I'm not, I'm going to put you in a situation that you don't have no other choice but to trust me. I told you I'm going to preach today. So I can bring you off your high horse and let you know, this is the next point, that God sometimes gives us a situation because let me be careful how I say this Lord he know the devil we the devil know we glory in things we like things and God said I want to take some things from you so you know you can live without some things. And you know, that's one reason why some of us want to go to heaven. Because of the golden streets and pearly gates. <laughs> want to go up to heaven. You want to take over there. Talk about I won't have I'm gonna hit the lottery in heaven. <laughs> Still think about money. Let me tell you something. It's not about Things God want to show you by not giving you things. Things doesn't make you happy. Once you get things and look at it for a while, it doesn't mean nothing. You've been wanting that lamp and now you're looking at it and just keep walking. You've been wanting this car and now you won't even wash it. You've been wanting this big old house and now you don't even clean it up. <laughs> we get we keep thinking that if things made people happy why are these folks with money killing themselves why are these movie stars saying it doesn't mean nothing why a man like Mike Tyson had a four million dollar mansion and smashing out all the windows why did the people that I've heard movie stars say they used to watch me on BT and say if it wasn't for you I wouldn't be living that were watching me all the time. That I didn't know. See, if they could tell you how they feel, why did the Michael Jackson have to go look like a thug to just walk downtown? Can't even come downtown and they arrested him in a place because he looked like a thug and didn't know it was Michael Jackson. That's how bad he was looking. And all a man want to do is walk downtown. Money will, whew, look what happened to Diana. I mean, car racing and she lost her life as a result of folk just rushing to get a picture of her. Things does not make you happy. And you want all these things. And God has said, I don't want you loving me for things. I want you to love me because of who I am. Don't want to come to heaven just so you don't have no trouble. I don't want you coming to heaven just so you can walk the pearly gates. Help me, Lord. If you got your mind and your health, be grateful for the little car you got. I know people in a house and they're not happy in it. And you fussing about that little old house you got. It's yours. 
You and your husband don't have to have a mansion to be happy. As long as you know each other. Amen. Just being with each other. I tell this story. One time a man, and forgive me for being a little late. One time a man, he was a king. And he was looking for a wife. Amen. Miss Lady, you listen to this. This is powerful. Okay, I know. Uh, he wanted a woman to love him for being a man. And guess what this king did? Ready? He went dressed up like a bomb and went in his kingdom and sat around and people threw rocks at him. And when he went to the door acting like at home, they get away from here, you bomb. And he kept going around just sitting in the, and he told his people in his palace, don't bother me. Run the kingdom, but I want a wife. And he sat around and everybody was said, that old stinking bomb, here he come again. But one young lady felt sorry for him. And she started coming to him and feeding him. And he was all dressed looking like some thug, and he looked at her. And all of a sudden, she started getting close to him. I want to help you. And he looked. Who are you? He wouldn't tell her his name. She said, but I want, God just sent me here to be a blessing to you. He looked. He said, what can you do for me? She said, I want to be your friend. And I want to take you around with me. He said, me, the way I look, I smell bad, I'm in rags, I'm embarrassing. She said, I don't care. But I have compassion. It's something about you I just like. <laughs> Guess what? She dated him for several weeks. She even went to it and slept in the street with him. <laughs> and he saw her love for him. He went back and said, I got to go somewhere and I'll call you later a few days. He went back and took off his junk and put on his royal robe and his crown and sat on the throne and said, go get that lady. The royal subject, what lady? The young lady that I just told you all about. They went and got her. She said, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Why? She said, we want to fix you up. They fixed her up. So, well, where am I going? The king wants to see you. And when she came in the great palace, she walked up. She said, your highness, your majesty, what would you want with me? She took off his crown. And he looked. He said, do you know who I am? She said, of course not. I'm the man that was the bomb that you took care of. She almost passed. You were the king? He said, yes. You're going to be my wife. She said, why me? He said, because you took me the way I am. And your love is real. I want somebody who will not love me for things of God. I want somebody to love me not because of who I am, but to take me just the way I am. That love got to be proven that it's not about things. A man may not have a lot of things to give you, but he'll give you his heart. He'll bathe you. When that old handsome, tall, handsome joker, you lose everything you got, gonna walk off and leave you, but this old bald-headed, pot-bellied joker will bathe you. <laughs> Sometimes God don't give you no choice in the matter because he didn't want to lose you. And sometimes God is using you when he doesn't give you no choice in the matter, he's using you. I just want to tell you this here before I leave, because I don't think I ever preach like this again. You know why some things not going the way you want it? 
You know why some things and you don't have a choice in the matter? I want you all to preach to me today. Name me some things that God won't take away that you don't have no choice in. Ready? Give me one. Huh? Problem. We talked about problem. Now give me one. Preach this morning. You'll preach this morning. Then I'm going to say amen. <laughs> All right. One of them is death. You don't have no choice in the matter. People are going to die. You can't get mad at God because he took your mother or took your best friend. I had to go through that when I lost my best friend, my son. He had to show me, do you love me more? I gave him to you. And I started preaching the harder after he passed. I said, I got both churches. Timmy wasn't preaching, nobody preaching. I had to show God he was yours, not mine. You can't get mad. God's not giving you the choice to keep your mother alive or your dad alive or dying of cancer or anything else. You don't have no choice in the matter but to trust God. Is that me? The enemy messing with me. This mic going out too? Is this battery going out too? Listen, saint, I know you're going to be watching me and say, oh my God, mama, you got to get up and listen to this sermon. That pastor's telling us why you don't have a choice in the matter, why you got to put it in God's hand. You can't stop folk from dying. They've been with you all these years. I had a friend of mine who tried to commit suicide in Megan because his mother died. They called me, I had to go down there and shake him and talk some sense in his head. Now he's preaching. I said, you get in God's business. I don't want to live. I said, what? Do you think your mother gone to heaven, going to be happy knowing you killed yourself? He looked at me. I'm mad at God. I said, I get mad at God a lot of times. So what? Can you do anything about it? You can't hit him. Swing, but you ain't swinging nothing but that. You better be scared to curse him. The devil want to use this. The devil want to make all this. Look, whew, thank you for revealing. The devil wants you to quit. Yeah. The devil want a few of y'all to quit coming because you don't see somebody. Your love for God is being tested, not Pastor Fleming. It's not about me, it's about him. You got to come here because you love God, not the preacher. Not your friends, not friends, foreign friends. You got to love God to get up early in the morning. To get up and go to work. Help me, Holy Ghost. Say, Lord, speak to him. They're going to die. And one of you is going to die one day. You don't have no choice in the matter. Just be prepared to die. Another thing, you don't have no choice in the matter. You can't help it because you're getting old. You can get all the face lift you want. You're just going to be a good looking old person. You ain't going to be no young person. Oh, I still look young. You still old. You might have lift that face, but you didn't lift every part of you. <laughs> Until that start looking at that hand, I know you. <laughs> I mean, some people don't like getting old. Look old. Sometimes look like your daughter. Be old. Wear shoes for old folk. And start wearing these high heels before you fall. <laughs> God help me to go. Then mama shouldn't be trying to compete with the daughter. Look like a mother. Look like a granddaddy. 
Now we walk around here with a big old gold chain talking about, what's up, dog? You go somewhere and sit down with your old self. You the one that dog. Woo, 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 woo. You can't even got breath and breathe. Look like a granddaddy. I don't want to be looking like my grandchildren. I want them to look at me and say, Papa. I'm teaching them, say, who am I? Papa. <laughs> Get old gracefully. Because one thing I need to say to all you young people. I can brag when I'm old because I've been as young as you are. And you may not get as old as I am. I'm going to tell them, when you look at me, you're looking at history. You might be the future, but I'm history. You can't do nothing about getting old. No choice in the matter. So learn how to get old and be graceful. Now here's what's what we'll, this was going to hit. You can't do nothing about marriage problems. You don't say I have no choice in the matter. Everybody go through problems in the family. And the children who get mad with mom and daddy, you better hope you and your husband make it. Amen. You better hope you and your wife make it. Amen. It's hard being married. Marriage is a challenge. I've been one woman 52 years. It's a challenge. It's a put up with. Marriage is a put up with. Yeah. I'm not talking about day in heaven with marriage. So is thunder and lightning. Yeah. You're going to fall out sometime. You're going to get out of bed sometime. You're going to go sleep on a hard bed until you get side of the sofa because you're going to wake up with so many backaches. Bro, you're going to get back in that bed. Yeah. <laughs> I got mad my wife got out of bed, so I got tired of that sofa. You know what you do. You get in first. <laughs> you, you just beat her in there. <laughs> so you don't feel embarrassed dragging in. <laughs> Welcome to marriage life. You're going to get in dispute. You can disagree, but not being disagreeable. You ain't supposed to be no slave. To nobody. You're supposed to enjoy and have some time of yourself. Then what you do. And I mean, men don't understand that. I don't know why in the world my wife was having a baby. And I was down there and I was telling everybody we having a baby. You ain't had no baby. She had the baby. <laughs> you come around, we had a baby. You didn't do nothing, bro. She had the baby, but we just had a baby. <laughs> All right, you better hear this one. You don't have no choice in how you look. Maybe you don't look like you want to look. You didn't pick being the color you are. Why you hate it? Because you don't look like other races. All races got something that other races wish they had. We not the only folk. Look, if you hate black people, then why are you out there in the hot sun burning up trying to get a tan? Then you not satisfied with your color. And why black folk want to try to get white? God likes color, or he wouldn't have made us different colors. Look, Chinese folk can eat rice and live. You and I die of malnutrition. They got a little bit of eye, and you wonder, can they see? They see everything. God made people and designed them, listen, to deal with the culture they're in. Right. Afro-American people are made less hairy, more smooth-skinned to deal with hot weather. 
and got melanin in them that won't give them cancer. Amen. Amen. The North Pole man is more hairy because he's saying from the cold weather. And white people can sit in a building freezing to death and we about to die freezing. And they said this is real good. Amen. We can't stand much cold weather. They can. God designed the body to deal with every culture. Africa to deal with the heat. The white people to deal with the North Pole. The Chinese to live on rice and live. Are you listening to me? God know what he's doing when he made you. So why do you hate the way you look? You question God. You're supposed to love yourself. Science said we got the best hair. And we talking about that nappy hair. Science said the nappy hair is the best hair. Some people have to go put stuff in their hair to get it hard to style it. I can sit out here and share. I see some mountains. I see some valleys. <laughs> Y'all take that hat off. I can tell you what kind of what I'm looking at. And it'll stay where you put it. Look, I saw one boy had his name in his head. Because we can design stuff with our hair. And you want your hair long and stringy. Nothing wrong with you want to look good. But you don't understand what you got from watching somebody else because you think you made wrong. You are made in the image God wants you to be in. Rejoice! And love yourself. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Live with it. Make the best of it. Everybody stand. When we start seeing our own value and what we have contributed, I'm going to tell you why I do old camp meetings. The Reverend Borders knew this. When I was at Mercer, out there you don't hear a pen drop. I start being sometimes the only black in the class. I start getting embarrassed about being black. They were showing a movie of African people in the jungle. And they were showing all the witch doctors and people walking around naked. And I started saying, oh, Jesus. So I'm peeping all the white folk in the class just looking. And you could see some of them. Why are these people working around with no clothes on? And afterward, I started hating me. And I walked in this pulpit. I came from that direction and came in the pulpit. May you might remember, it's been so long. I said, y'all sit down. That's what's wrong with black folk. Y'all shout too much. I started hating all that. Because they had conditioned me. And somebody called Reverend Borders and said, you better go get your boy. And he called me and said, get down here. I said, what you want, Pop? Get down here. I said, what? You finna get in the car with you, and you go into Morehouse. I said, I'm not going to Morehouse College. I'm a senior over here at Mercer. You going with me. He got in my car, and I drove him up to Morehouse. Never been. He said, this is where Martin Luther King this is, or this is with Dr. Mays, young man. When I walked on that campus, I thought it looked like the president walked in Morehouse. I was walking with the man to see who he is. And the president, Dr. Gloss and Dr. Perdue, ran from the office. Borders is on the campus. I didn't know Reverend Borders taught at Morehouse. I said, I'm looking. Look. And they ran up. Dr. Borders, Dr. Borders, Dr. Badoo came down all the ministry. They said, Get on Borders is on campus. And they were running down there, and I'm standing there beside him. Dr. Borders, Dr. Gloss was there. Let me show you the new administrative area. Let me show you what we got new here. And Borders was just looking. 
And brother said, that's not why I'm here. He said, what you want? He said, I brought this young preacher. He looked at me and said, how you doing? Oh, Dr. Borders. <laughs> Just overlooked me. And Dr. Borders, he said, I, I'm so grateful for all of this at Morehouse. But I brought this young preacher here. Who is it? He's a preacher. This is the way. He pastored a church over there in Summer Hill, Mount Carmel. They looked. And they said, how you doing? I said three or four words. They looked at each other. Borders being an educator said, I know he doesn't sound all articulate like you want, but his words are green. They look, his words are green, and you don't know who this is. And after a while, he said, I want him in more house. In five minutes, I ain't went through no orientation. I was in Mohouse College. And I was mad because they knocked me back to junior, sophomore. <laughs> they took all my hours. And when I finally sat in Morehouse, I never heard people laughing and joking. I didn't mercy, you know, white school, all quiet. I'm going in there, black people laughing and talking all on camera. I was feeling lost. What, what, what did? And all of a sudden, Dr. Whalem got a hold of me and taught me church music and taught me forms of music. And then I took history and learned about Nat Turner. And I never knew about what black folk had created and contributed to America. And we got to study about the contribution that blacks gave America. And went to hear an old song of Rolling Hayes. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. And I start hearing rolling. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. And Mary, when he's got the whole world in his head, I start looking at what we got. And I went back to my country days when I was a little boy stomping the floor with an old camp meeting. And hearing the primitive Baptist singing those old songs that C.J. Johnson was singing, but I knew where they came from. Primitive Baptist. I reached back and grabbed old camp meeting songs to tell everybody who I am. And old camp meeting songs has opened doors for me around the world. Uh, Harvard University of Yale asked me for my takes. I found my identity. I started loving myself. Because who gave you rap? It's from the church. Who got the soul in them that nobody can sing? It's from slavery. And I started loving me. And that set me free. Why well, I'm your pastor the way I am today. Amen. Amen. So, you got to find yourself and love yourself because that's the way God made you. I want to take this message ought to be growing around the world. The devil messed with me trying to mess up my mic. Didn't want this message today. Put it in God's hand when you don't have a choice in the matter. Father, I know I've healed some hearts today, set some captives free. The devil don't want us to win. He want us to quit watching somebody else and not pay attention to our own gifts. He wants us to throw in the tower he wants us to get up and just die when we can still live. He wants us to turn away from God. Go home and sit down and put on a pity party and quit coming to church. And I refuse to let him win. I want your grace because it is sufficient. And I'm going to carry this thorn in my flesh no matter what I have to face. Amen. Now listen. 
you may have a weakness. You may be struggling with something and it's not going nowhere. And you may be wrestling with some emotional drive, some sexual drives that you don't want nobody here to know about. But let me tell you something. You got to put that in God's hand. Because you can't change yourself. I don't want you killing yourself. I don't want you putting no gun to your head because of what you feel. Here's what you're going to have to do with your weakness. You've got to put that in God's hand. And sometimes you've just got to keep your feelings to yourself. It's not a sin. You just don't have to commit it. And if your urges and desires won't go nowhere, that's a part of how you made. Say it now. So you got to just say, Lord, I can't change myself, but I can control what I do. Amen. And I'm going to ask you to strengthen me if you don't move this mountain. Give me strength to climb. I may stumble sometime, I may fall sometime, I may go back, but I'm coming back, and I'm coming through. And I'm going to put it in your hand. If you want this message, it's going to be on all week. Somebody need to listen to it before you blow your brains out. God is still using you. And sometimes, he let things stay in our way to keep us on our knees. You receive it. You are dismissed. May God be with you. Now that's a sermon I think I'll buy back there.